testing, testing. Testing, testing. Okay, we're back. We've got one video stream thing working, and they're working on YouTube, so everything should be fine in a couple of minutes. Uh, we were about to call the vote so that we have all the consent items 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3 moved by Councillor Turner and seconded by Councillor Hopkins. Uh, and so if there are no other comments, I will call the vote. <laughs> Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, scheduled items 3.1 uh, delegation from Mr. Kirkness, who I don't see in the gallery yet, so we'll move on to 2.2 we'll, or 3.2 and we'll come. I, oh, 
Is there someone here instead of Mr. Kirkness? No, we can, so we'll wait for that one. We'll go to 3.2. Uh, All right, sorry, this is, uh, we're just, we're just, we're doing things on the fly here. So I'm gonna jump ahead to 3.3. .3. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna go to 3.3. .3. Uh, which is a delegation from Ms. Wally uh, and the third report of the London Advisory Committee on Heritage. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I uh, just want to remind everyone this is Heritage Week and so happy Heritage Week to all of you. Um, I'm giving the report on the Latch meeting. Um, we went through, oh, and I should also point this out to you. This goes to all the uh, homeowners who live in heritage conservation districts every year. So they've had one or they should be getting one any time now for this year. Uh, we received um, a report on the amendment of the property standards by law for vacant buildings, um, particularly as this refers to heritage buildings and Latch welcomes the fact that these properties will be evaluated on an individual basis by professionals. Um, it was felt that heritage properties should be more precisely defined, however, as either designated or listed. Um, designated properties receive enhanced considerations and listed properties do not. Um, I also want to speak about three heritage alteration permits that we had at the uh, meeting. Uh, 938 Lawn Avenue, uh, we're, we're looking for a retrospective heritage alteration per permit for the new roof on this property. The staff recommendation was for a refusal of this due to the inappropriate materials, color and appearance of the sheet metal roof on a Queen Anne style house. The Latch Committee voted for approval, however, due to the cost for the homeowner. However, it was noted that although roofs are an expensive item, they along with window replacement with vinyl products are the, the issues that are most often brought to our consideration. Homeowners need to be more aware of the guidelines for HCDs and that's partly what that postcard would be for. Um, 1058 Richmond Street they originally had a wood shingle roof um, which has been also been replaced with inappropriate materials. Due to the style and design of this particular property, the roof is a very prominent feature that contributes greatly to the heritage attributes of this part four designated property. And Latch supported staff recommendation to refuse this heritage alteration permit. Um, 40 and 42 Askin Street it is planned to replace the very numerous windows on this property with vinyl windows throughout. Again, Latch supported staff recommendation to refuse this on the basis that wood windows are or can be repa repaired without being replaced and, appro and appropriate for the style and period of the property. The Heritage Planner supplied a very informative report on wood windows. Homeowners need to be aware of the repair or replacement of wood with wood and that there are now more, far more uh, artisans and craftsmen available for this process. Stewardship, the subcommittee um, continues its research on 197 Ann Street. We have been made aware that this property along with adjacent houses was asso associated with the brewery constitute original buildings of the old Kent Brewery, which has been on this site since 1859. The original brewery uh, building was refa refaced with brick in the late 19th century and represents not only the last remaining original brewery building in London, but may also constitute the oldest structure in the North Talbot neighborhood, which is planned to be the next HCD in London. 435, 441, 451 Rideout Street. Latch convened a working group to consider this proposal in detail as it concerns such an important site. This is the Rideout Street complex. The objections noted center around the site and placement of this proposal, particularly as it would be so prominent an intrusion into what is London's heritage heartland. Uh, the Forks of the Thames, the old courthouse and Eldon House, and of course the Rideout Street complex itself. This proposal was considered inappropriate in height, 
design materials and siting. It impedes views and compromising, compromises historic landscapes, especially noted in part four and part five designation of the Ride Out Steep complex um, guidelines and statements. The properties are also a National Historic Site. The development presents a large intrusion that serves to di diminish the impact and historical importance of the Rideout Street complex. And, it, and it, uh, it constitutes a considerable detriment to Eldon House and its garden. Latch considered and approved the working group's report. The final uh, uh, item was the Heritage Planners report. Um, there, it's noted that the register has been updated and has now been printed up for circulation this year. 96 properties were added to the register. 94 of these were in Old East Village, Dundas Street Corridor Secondary Plan. Three properties received individual designations, 336 Piccadilly, the, fugitive slave, the former Fugitive Slave Chapel on 432 Gray Street and Kilworth United Church at 2442 Oxford Street West and 127 heritage alteration permits were processed. Thank you, that concludes my report. And if any, you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Ms. Wally. Any questions for the delegate? Ms. Councillor Turner. Uh, thank you, Sri, Mr. Ch uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Wally, for coming tonight. Uh, just with respect to the, uh, the retroactive uh, approvals for alternation, alterations for, for the two properties, in one circumstance, uh, uh, recommendation was not to refuse based on the cost of uh, redoing the work. And it sounds like in both circumstances, those were roof uh, replacements, the Richmond uh, as well. So in one case, yes, one case, no. Um, just looking for the consistency of the, uh, of the decisions in those two, uh, or the rationale for the inconsistency between the two of them. Yes, you're quite right. Um, it, it, it is somewhat inconsistent. If you look at the property on Richmond Street, you can see that it's a craftsman-style cottage. The roof comes down, you know, down two or three stories. It's very, very prominent, and it was an important part of the designated uh, designation of that property was the roof. Um, with the um, Askin Street one, um, I think I think we there was some disagreement. <laughs> Um, I'm personally not um, in favor of blue sheet metal roofs on Queen Anne cottages. I feel that it's not terribly appropriate, but certainly other members of the latch um, felt that it was asking too much to ask this property owner to replace it at this point. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have to receive the report from the advisory committee. There are also a number of recommendations in the report uh, that I believe would be in the motion that we can pull up on the screen. So I am looking for a mover for the recommendations from the advisory committee. Moved by Deputy Mayor Helmer and seconded by Councillor Kayabaga. Any questions or comments? No, nope. then I'll call the vote. Our delegate is still not here. So we'll go to 3.2, which is a public participation meeting for uh, the application for 1600-1622 Hyde Park Road and 1069 Gainsborough Road. Uh, I'll look in the gallery. Are there members of the public here for this item? Anybody here? Yes. Are you with the applicant? No? Okay. So I will uh, go to... Uh, staff for a presentation on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
this application was subject sorry ms debert first we have to i would have a motion to open the public participation meeting moved by councillor hopkins seconded by councillor kayabaga and we'll vote on that Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Go ahead, Ms. Demmer. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this application is at addresses known as 1600, 1622 Hyde Park Road, and 1069 Gainsborough Road. Uh, the original application included five parcels of land stretching along the length of Hyde Park Road between Gainsborough Road and North Rutledge Park. Um, on the illustration on the screen, you can see the area that's the current subject of the application in the um, solid red outline and the area that was previously um, subject to the application uh, outlined in the dotted red line. Uh, <clears throat> the property is located at the main intersection of the Hyde Park Village and surrounded by commercial and light industrial development, the Hyde Park Village Green and low density residential uses. Uh, from a policy perspective, in the 1989 official plan, the property is designated Main Street Commercial Corridor, which is intended to encourage the redevelopment of vacant and underutilized properties in a way that is compatible with adjacent development. Permitted uses include a wide range of commercial, office, institutional, and residential uses through the development of mixed-use buildings. In the London plan, uh, it's in the Main Street place type, encouraging the regeneration of historic Main Streets, and again, permitting a broad range of uses, including residential, retail, service, and office uses in mixed-use buildings. So the original site concept uh, was a mixed-use development contained in six buildings, including two new 12-story uh, apartment buildings with a total of 410 dwelling units and four, pardon me, <clears throat> four new one- to two-story commercial office buildings uh, with a gross floor area of almost 3,000 square meters. Uh, the equivalent density uh, for the mixed-use development was 243 units per hectare and it also included a combination of underground and surface parking. This is the rendering of the original proposal, um, and I just want to point out that it included uh, the apartment building component was located away from the Hyde Park and Gainsborough intersection. You can see that it's set back um, from the main street. This is the revised site concept. It's a mixed-use development in one new eight-story building with a total of 155 dwelling units and 997 square meters of commercial office space or commercial retail space equivalent to a density of 150 units per hectare and in this version all of the parking is to be accommodated in a surface parking lot to the rear of the building this is the revised rendering for the new proposal um, and you'll see that the apartment building component has been moved forward over top of the commercial component, making it a true mixed-use development. Um, the other thing to point out with this version is that there's um, some variable stepping back on Hyde Park Road uh, above the commercial component and again at the seventh floor to create a more pedestrian-friendly uh, environment. So the requested um, zoning under the revised proposal is to rezone the property from a business district commercial zone to a business district commercial special provision zone. The special provisions would be dealing with height and density, which need to be established on a site-specific basis. To permit the dwelling units on the main floor along the Gainsborough Road, where they are normally intended to be included um, on the second story or above or behind. Um, a commercial front to permit a maximum floor area for a restaurant use of 605 square meters 
to reduce the re uh, residential parking rate to one space per unit and to apply a standard flat rate commercial parking rate of one space per 20 meters squared. With respect to use, the proposed mixed-use apartment building is already and currently a permitted use within the existing business district commercial zone. Um, and residential developments in the BDC zone require a zoning amendment specifically to establish the permitted height and densities. <coughs> With respect to intensity, um, the Main Street Commercial Corridor designation in the 1989 official plan permits a maximum density of 150 units per hectare and does not control height. The Main Street place type in the London plan permits a maximum of four stories and allows up to six stories with bonusing. It requires that buildings are designed to fit the scale and character of the surrounding streetscape while allowing for appropriate infill and redevelopment. And I just want to point out at this point, the policies um, for the Main Street place type, type are in force but the maps that enable the Main Street place type are not. The proposed development is in keeping with the policies, as the proposed eight-story building has been designed in a manner which will fit within the existing and planned scale and character of the surrounding streetscape. With respect to form, uh, both Urban Design staff and the Urban Design Peer Review Panel uh, reviewed this proposal. Um, the Urban Design Peer Review Panel review was limited to the initial uh, application and not the revision. Uh, the urban design staff were supportive of the revised proposed design and from our re review the uh, urban design peer review panel comments regarding height and a true mixed-use approach were addressed through the building redesign in the resubmission. <clears throat> the development is able to integrate with the existing main street while setting a positive tone at the main intersection of the Hyde Park Village for future development. The building location along the street frontages creates a strong street wall setting, uh, setting the context for a comfortable pedestrian environment. The site layout helps to establish the desired setback of the main street corridor for future development and the use of um, step backs in the building design, a variety of materials and fenestration create an appropriate scale and rhythm of development. Um, we didn't have a lot of public concern on this. Um, one of the main ones was height. Um, this concern was, was expressed with respect to the 12-story proposal, um, and we believe that this issue has been addressed through the reduction in the height of the building to two-thirds of the original height. <coughs> the building is going to be located adjacent to the east property line, separating the building as far as possible from residential uses to the west. And in the view of the uh, planning services, the recommended height is appropriate for the main intersection in the Hyde Park Village. Uh, the other major concern was with respect to traffic. Um, there were a lot of um, sort of moving parts with this uh, one, was the existing traffic volume and flow and turning movements as well as cut through traffic on Prince of Wales Road. Um, I'd like to point out that Hyde Park Road and Gainsborough Road are both arterial roads which are intended to move large volumes of traffic. Um, so actually this type of development where um, the, the volume is going to be accommodated on arterial roads is completely appropriate. Um, a traffic impact assessment was completed for the original proposal but needs to be revised and updated at the site plan stage and at that point we'll be identifying appropriate traffic control measures for this new development. Our recommendation is for approval of the requested revised zoning amendment as it is consistent with the provincial policy statement and the enforced policies of the London plan and the 1989 official plan. It results in the development of an underutilized site, provides intensification at an appropriate location, provides an appropriate form of development, and ensures a high quality design uh, is achieved. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Dever. Any technical questions? Uh, Councillor Turner. Uh, if I might, through you, just a really quick question with respect to the, um, the difference between bonusing and a special policy um, area, a uh, special provision within the BDC. So the BD, just to clarify, the BDC uh, zone itself 
and doesn't allow for that density, but the, um, the Main Street Commercial Corridor policies of the 89 official plan allow for the density of 150 units. So we need to be able to create a special provision within the BDC zoning to allow for that density, but the general uh, Main Street Commercial policies allow for it as of right. Uh, so we don't get into the area of bonusing. It, it, just, it seems... I, uh, is it sufficient to confirm that you've correctly assessed the situation? <laughs> I think that's that's fair enough. It's uh, it's confusing on that front, but uh, I can appreciate the nuance to it. So, really, in this case, no bonusing required because, as of right, it's allowed. But the zoning needs the special provision in order to allow for that density. So the OP allows for it, but the the zone itself doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, just if I can, you are correct, if I can just expand on that um, briefly, the way the zoning bylaw is set up, it's not set up to pre-establish the heights and densities for the residential component of a mixed-use development. They're intended to be reviewed on a site-specific basis, so um, that's what was done with this application, and at the end of the day, we um, concluded that eight stories and 150 units per hectare was appropriate for this location. If I might, just one second question. Um, uh, recognizing the setback and the step back on Hyde Park uh, as it's a, a Main Street commercial corridor, uh, but the lower order of road at, at Gainsborough uh, ends up just basically seeing a vertical wall on it. Was there any consideration for setback or step backing uh, from the, uh, the facade on Gainsborough? Um, they're actually both um, arterial roads, um, but in terms of the uh, the importance from a design perspective, Hyde Park Road um, is considered to be more important. Um, we did talk to the applicant about extending the commercial component along the frontage of Gainsborough Road, but there really uh, didn't seem to be a market right now for um, that commercial frontage to extend. So um, a design compromise that was made was to allow residential to the main floor. Um, if you look at the um, I don't know if you've got it on your screens. The, uh, the main floor is differentiated along Gainsborough, but not to the same extent as along the Hyde Park frontage. Thank you. I recognized in the report it talked about how those could be uh, later converted to commercial if the need arose. But that's why they were designed in that way. But it was just more the, the, the kind of the blunt facade uh, rather than the setback at the, the, the higher levels. But uh, I can appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, th and for you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question around the parking, and in particular, the retail parking. Is there, s if you could just expand on the parking spaces, and the is there sufficient parking for retail or? Uh, yes, we believe, um, based on our analysis, that there is sufficient parking there. Um, there are benefits to mixed-use development in that the time of day demand for parking um, is different because you have people who are living in the uh, units needing most of the parking in the evening hours, people working in the commercial components. Typically, you know, some will operate in the evenings, but a lot of them will operate only during daytime hours, so there are benefits to be achieved from the sharing of those parking spaces. Um, and our uh, uh, base rate of one space per 20 square meters is fairly standard for a, for a sort of across the board rate for commercial use. Any other technical questions? No. Thank you, Ms. Debert. Um, is the applicant here? Would you like to comment? investments. Um, we have no further comments at this time, um, but I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there any members of the public who would like to speak? You can state your name and you'll have five minutes. Well, this one's tough, isn't it? My name is Robert Hewitt. I uh, live in the area for my whole life. Uh, I really want to speak in favor of the development. And I think it's a very positive thing for the high park community to have that development on that corner that corner has been a bit of an eyesore for years and years uh, 
undeveloped basically, uh, used as a parking lot. But now you're going to have a really good use there, uh, something that's going to add a lot of value to everyone in the area. So I really want to emphasize support of that. But what I'm questioning is more uh, due to the special provision aspect of this. So I'd just like some clarification as to what's actually being granted here. So the various aspects of the special provision that were displayed up there, uh, residences on the main floor, uh, the, re the restaurant at this size, the parking at whatever, the height, the bonusing, or I guess not bonusing, but the amount of units that are allowed and all that stuff. Is the special provision actually, is it designed to override anything in the zoning bylaw that would be contrary to what's being granted here today? So the way that we do the public participation meetings is you get all your questions out and then if there are any other questions from the public, we, we keep track of them and then at the end, staff answer all of the questions okay. at one time. I'll keep going then. Go ahead. Okay, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, and to speak to the integrity of the special provision that's being granted is, could it later somehow be interpreted, uh, so the way it's being presented and the use that it's being granted for here today, could it somehow be interpreted later down the road uh, as development changes in a different way than what's actually being granted here? Could staff actually interpret it a way different than what's actually worded here? So if you look at uh, where you go to purpose and effect here, does the purpose and effect clarify what's being granted here today, or could it ever be interpreted in a way that the purpose and effect is makes no sense? Or you know what I'm saying? It's really to the integrity of when something is granted in this way. Is it really like a zoning right that cannot be changed after it's granted by a council? Um, would the special provision be granted in a way that, or worded in a way, or interpreted in a way that would make it impossible? So could it be granted for a height that's impossible or some sort of building aspect that's impossible? When the special provision is being granted, it's assumed, I would understand, that that means the city's in agreement with what's actually in the special provision, meaning you would never grant a special provision for something that later on you would never allow. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this application? Yes, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jim Strawn. I live and work in the area as well. Um, can you can you speak a little closer to the mic? Oh, okay. Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> All right. My name is Jim Strawn. I, I live and work in the area. Quite close, actually. And um, I just thought I'd drop by and uh, my comments just in that I think anyone I've talked to in the neighborhood, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we realize there's going to be some inconveniences over dust and noise and that sort of thing, but the net benefit, I think, to the area is much greater, and um, we're re really looking forward to it being completed. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the public on this particular application? I'm not seeing any. So I'll look for a motion to close the public participation meeting, moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Deputy Mayor Helmer, and I'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. So Ms. Debert, there were some questions about being about the special provision and exactly very specifically what it means what it covers can it can uh, can the application can the development be changed down the road from what's been granted through the special p provision okay so I'll take my best shot at this um, uh, the first question was do the special provisions override the zoning bylaw standards that are set out in the standard zone and the simple answer to that is yes they do so anything that's a special provision that's dealt with elsewhere in the bylaw the special provision overrides that and becomes part of the zoning for this property 
Um, the second question was with respect to the integrity of the zoning, and, and I think what that was getting at is, um, is the neighborhood going to get what it's seeing today in the presentation? Um, so I have a several part answer to that question. Um, first of all, um, the applicant will be obligated to develop in accordance with the special provisions and the standard zones, that standard zone requirements that still apply. So um, through the zoning, basically a sort of box for development has been created. So the building will need to be located, um, in this case, in the business district commercial zone. The building will have to be located close to the street because the base business district commercial zone requires between zero and three meters of front yard setback and doesn't allow it to be any bigger. So the building is going to be up to the frontage of Hyde Park and Gainsborough. Um, it's going to be up to 150 units per hectare. It's going to be up to eight stories. Because this wasn't a bonus zone where we often tie design uh, to an exact development, uh, we don't have those same kind of guarantees that exactly this development will occur. Um, however, what I didn't cover in my presentation was part of the recommendation uh, for Council's uh, consideration, which includes the main components of what we're looking for in terms of the development design that the site plan um, staff are being made aware of so that they can uh, consider those aspects of design through the site plan approval process. I hope I've answered the question. I'm happy to answer more if it's not clear. So I'm getting a, sh a shake of the head from, from the gallery. Um, so I think uh, the, what I wrote down is, can the special provision be interpreted differently down the road? So I understand with bonusing, what you see is what you get, pretty much. We, we, we put those things right in the, the rezoning. Um, but, but a special provision is slightly different. So how much is certain um, versus how much could be interpreted differently? Um, so um, everything that's got a number or a qualitative aspect associated with it in the zoning bylaw, um, say for example, the maximum height of eight stories, it can't be interpreted to be nine stories. If someone came in with an application for a nine-story building, they would have to apply for minor variance um, or come back for a rezoning. Um, the density, they're not going to be able to go under over 150 units per hectare. Um, the same for the parking. Those are sort of minimums and maximums are set, and those are subject to interpretation, but only in that the people interpreting the bylaw for the city are going to look at the proposal the site plan application that comes in and they're going to make sure it matches. Um, there are some other qualitative aspects of the development that will be subject to site plan review that aren't dealt with in the zoning bylaw. So for example, the stepping down of um, from eight stories to seven stories along the Hyde Park frontage, we're relying on the applicant to come in and do what they showed us. Um, the, um, the stepping back above the commercial component. We're relying on them to come in and do that, do what they've shown us. Um, colors, the amount of glazing, the types of finishes on the building are all subject to the site plan approval process but are not subject to the zoning bylaw that is being considered today. So the height and the density are pretty much locked in. The, uh, the height of the building and the density and the, the parking, the amount of parking, that's pretty much locked in. That can't be changed in the future. The design itself, how it actually looks, that the, the, the applicant gives their um, intent, but that's not locked in. That would have been locked in through a bonus zone. Um, but as part of the recommendation, some of those details, and I see Mr. Yeoman looking at me, some of those details will be dealt with at the site plan phase so that there's a separate phase where they actually come down to get the building permit and they actually uh, get down to the nitty gritty details of what's going to be built. They work with site plan staff at that phase and so our site plan staff know 
what the intent is for the design and we'll be working with the applicant to try to ensure that the design that's being proposed is what actually gets built. I see Mr. Yeoman signaling me. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, just uh, very quickly, just to build on what Ms. Deppard said for the benefit of the public as well, I think it's important to flag that the um, site plan review is also based on the official plan policy framework that's informing what's before you today for our recommendations. So the zoning piece is one part of the development puzzle. The site plan is as well, but they're both working to achieve the official plan policies that we've uh, uh, Council's approved and articulated. Okay. Any any comments, questions from committee? No. So, Mr. Hewitt, I, I imagine you do have Ms. Debert's email address, possibly her phone number. I encourage you to stay in touch with her as well, and, and you guys can have those really detailed conversations. Also, your counselor, uh, Josh Morgan, sent me his regrets this, uh, this morning. He was not able to, to make this meeting. But those are two very good resources as, as this process unfolds to, to get some uh, back and forth conversation going on. Thank you for coming and thank you as well to Mr. Strawn for your, your comments. Uh, if there are no further, oh, Councillor Kayabaga. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, um, Madam Chair, I just had some comments um, that not, are not going to go deep into this specific um, development, but I just have a general question around other developments like this one where we have 155 units that are um, proposed and uh, we don't have any structure or infrastructure around how to make sure that we also get affordable housing around that. Because I did ask before I, I asked this question and um, I think Councillor Turner was trying to explain to me something around bonusing and I, I'm trying to understand if we, um, I know that the last council talked about inclusionary zoning and um, we're in our second year of this term and I haven't heard anything um, around that. How do, we, how do we encourage developers to continue to provide affordable housing where when we're in an area where there's crisis there's a housing crisis in London especially in the rental market so I want to know how we can we can prevent you know um, losing the opportunity of getting quite a bit of number of affordable housing in the future when we have such a great development that has mixed use and that could provide um, the room to have more rent that's more affordable and that's more um, that's more pertained to the to the community of London. Mr. Yeoman. Uh, three, Madam Chair, so that's an excellent question, Councillor, and it's one that we're continuing to work through. Um, as you did mention, um, because the site is not bonused, it's difficult for us to compel specific affordable housing units in the site. Um, what I can say is that in the spectrum of affordability, um, apartments are inherently more affordable perhaps than single family homes or, or things like that. So there is some degree of affordability that's built in the project. I, I grant that that's a bit of a slippery slope when we start talking about affordability, um, especially as we go forward in the, the post bill 108 world once bonusing leaves we do have uh, policies in the official plan that do speak to affordability uh, you did flag the tool of affordable or sorry inclusionary zoning which is a, a conditional zoning a way of achieving uh, certain units in the building we're waiting to hear more information from the province on that but it's something we're going to be definitely exploring now that, that tool is going away and we're looking to replace it as we go forward thank you any other comments or questions um, there is a staff recommendation. It's being moved by Deputy Mayor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Hopkins, and Councillor Hopkins would like to speak. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd be pleased to second this recommendation. I'm very familiar with this corner. I know it's been an eyesore in the community for many, many, many years. So um, generally uh, supportive. I'm glad to see some changes have been made. That density, uh, bringing down that density, I think is is uh, appropriate for this area. I'm glad to hear that uh, through the site plan process that uh, traffic controls will be looked at. I heard Gainsborough and Hyde Park are two arterial roads, but Hyde Park and Gainsborough, especially this Gainsborough, aren't the two roads that are the same. Gainsborough is very narrow in that area. The entrance is coming off that. So I just want to make that comment. Traffic controls in this area I think would be um, good to look at. And uh, again, happy to second the recommendation. Okay. There are no other comments or questions. I can call the vote.
closing the vote. The motion carries five to zero. Okay, working backwards, we're, go we're going back to item 3.1, and we have a delegation from Mr. Kirkness. So first I need a motion to, to grant the delegation request, if council so, or committee so deems that. Um, moved by Councillor Kayabaga and seconded by Councillor Turner. I'll call that vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, so this is a concerning item 3.1, which is a request for council resolution under section 45, 1.4 of the Planning Act, and it's 1331 Hyde Park Road. Go ahead, Mr. Kirkness, you have five minutes. Oh. Um. Oh, there goes 30 seconds. Um, uh, Madam Chair and committee members, thank you very much. Laverne Kirkness of Kirkness Consulting. 3.1, um, th this is kind of, you've had these requests before. I know I have made them, and it's because of the two-year hiatus from when the zoning bylaw is passed. So basically on Hyde Park Road at 1331 is this new commercial plaza. You might have noticed that just north of the tracks, just north of... Uh, crossings uh, and it has a BMW and an Indian uh, motorcycle dealership at the, along the front of it. The rest of the frontage is this restaurant called Taverna or to be called Taverna. I think it's open now as a matter of fact. It's the same people that run the Abruzzi restaurant on King Street downtown um, but it's a different venue but it's the same people kind of a quality restaurant. Uh, they would like to put a um, uh, patio out the north side of in the northerly side yard close to the street uh, there are seven spaces short also when you're abutting a residential zone you're supposed to be in the front yard but at the site plan stage the city's urban design standards kind of had to put the whole building out in front so there's no front yard to put the patio on um, this is next to, to the north is it is an auto tire repair shop uh, and uh, so um, we wanted to apply to the Committee of Adjustment for a minor variance for two variances. One, to put the patio in the side yard and also to relieve ourselves of the seven spaces that would be required for the patio. We have almost 100 spaces in the back uh, for the existing development. Um, and, of course, the Planning Act requires uh, that uh, if we aren't beyond the two-year anniversary of an amendment to that zone, we need to get an approval from Council and, therefore, we're here tonight to ask Planning Committee if you would recommend to Council that we have permission to make an application for those two minor variances. Uh, it's well laid out by the staff, I must say, and mapping and that sort of thing in the agenda. But if you have any questions, I'd be glad to uh, respond. Uh, we're seeking then permission to make an application to the Committee of Adjustment for those two. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Any questions uh, from committee? Deputy Mayor Helmer. Um, I'll move the required motion to have it go ahead to the Committee of Adjustment. Perfect, thank you. Um, Councillor Turner, you're seconding that. Any, any other comments? Great, that was quick. We will call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was worth the wait. Uh, I'll move to items for direction. Item 4.1 is the third report of the Advisory Committee on the Environment. Uh, would some, are there any questions or comments from committee on this report? I'm not seeing any. Do I have a mover? There are some recommendations uh, in the report, and uh, they will be on your screen if you refresh it. 
பாட்டுன்னு So the motion is up. It's moved by Councillor Hopkins. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Kaibaga. Councillor Turner, go ahead. Yeah, with respect to uh, number C, we we had this item before, and it came. Uh, we sent it back, and to, it's returned back here. Um, the uh, uh, looking specifically for non-voting position for faculty or graduate student from a rel relative discipline such as environmental studies, sustainability, or geography. Uh, in in this circumstance, uh, um, it, what they're basically oh I guess we we recently uh, had the discussion about uh, removing specific allocations for voting members, um, and I guess that's what this reflects. But it seems that uh, uh, that's where ACE had had representation. EPAC, for example, also had uh, very specific uh, uh, categories of membership to say we need somebody from this sector and this, so that it was a little more cross representative of fields. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be just as uh, as willing to make it a voting member if, uh, as part of the committee's terms of references rather than a, a resource member because it doesn't really represent an agency uh, specifically uh, as a non-voting member would do in, in these circumstances. I'm fine either way, I suppose, but uh, it, it just seemed a little, a little odd to, to have, a, a, I guess, a very broad category for a non-voting position, which is typically representative of a very specific constituency. Any other comments or questions? Did you want a, a response from anybody on that, Councillor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, from a staff perspective, um, uh, we're happy either voting or non-voting. Um, I think the concern that was uh, raised is really um, restricting um, who that person could be by the qualifications now it's more broad so if you wanted to recommend that it be voting member on the terms of reference we could certainly uh, change the terms of reference to indicate that uh, thank you uh, that's helpful I, I guess I didn't really quite have the context from the committee either and I'm not sure where where their discussion had landed but uh, it seems uh, to make sense that, it, that it's a voting position uh, so I would make that amendment if if that was acceptable to the committee, that uh, the member would be a voting member. So I think from my read of the report is that it was a non-voting member, and very specific on who that non-voting member or those non-voting members could be, and they're just, they weren't seeking to change it from a non-voting to a voting, they were just seeking to broaden uh, who could fill those positions. Yeah, uh, having uh, three you, or two, you, Madam Chair, um, uh, having having had uh, a fairly extensive experience on this committee, um, <laughs> and having been around when the idea for uh, having a non-voting membership for uh, the Institute of Cat Catastrophic Research, a very specific uh, membership, which uh, was to weigh in on uh, climate change adaptation modeling. Uh, especially around floodplains and things like that, uh, that's where this uh, this came into play, and that's the rec uh, reason for that resource non-voting resource member to have been there. In the same way, other agent external agencies have non-voting members on some of the advisory committees. When they change it to this in the recommendation that it's uh, it's somebody in those as, as a faculty or student in those relative disciplines, it becomes a broad. Uh, uh, in, the, in the same way that in EPAC we look for somebody who might have uh, ecology or limnology or um, uh, landscape architecture backgrounds, uh, and they're all voting members. So in this case, uh, having somebody with that background and understanding, uh, it it seems misplaced to just limit them to non-voting members uh, it, it seems appropriate to have them as a voting member okay uh, so there is a recommend uh, there is a motion to amend this uh, this recommendation from the committee I'll go to deputy mayor Helmer uh, through the chair uh, perhaps to the clerk uh, could we be reminded of the overall review around the advisory committees and when that's going to be landing I'm, I'm a little reluctant to make changes to individual committees as we're going when we know that there's another process underway um, I know that the advisory committee has made this recommendation to us now 
twice. Um, I don't want to be stubborn about it, but I do want to make sure I understand the timelines we're working on. Hey, Madam Chair, um, it's my understanding from uh, Ms. West Lake Power that a report will be coming in April. Um, so I hear where my colleague is uh, coming from, Councillor Turner. Um, we made a number of changes when we filled these positions on our shorter term, uh, the last round of appointments, uh, especially when it comes to the voting member positions. Uh, to make them more like uh, these are all at large positions now we're going to get rid of all these requirements we're going to fill them on a temporary basis we're going to have this report come back uh, i'm i would be more comfortable waiting for that report to land and then making adjustments to the membership of the committee at that time you know we know about this one this has been a request that people have made generally speaking i think it it makes sense if non-voting members from particular organizations are not participating that we can just drop them i'm not even sure they need to be converted to other positions, like I, maybe they can just be eliminated. Um, and if we need to add more voting members to a committee for some reason, I would like to consider that in sort of the totality of what's on the committee, not just converting non-voting to voting. And anyway, and I also just wanted, wanted to do an isolation uh, one-off with this particular committee. Um, as it happens, I was just out at the Biotron, which is what I think is being referenced with the Biodrome. Um, and they were talking to me about how they would really like to get more involved with the city <laughs> so there's a position right there that you know potentially have some connection so I you know I, I don't want to uh, uh, send it back for no reason but I do think if we're having a report in April uh, waiting might be the best course of action Councillor Turner um, so then I, I think in light of the deputy mayor's comments which I think are, are well uh, uh, founded that uh, D be referred to the advisory com committee review process um, for consideration and, and brought back at the appropriate time. I, I just pulled up the terms of reference for ACE and uh, there are, there's even more prescriptive uh, a breadth of non-voting resource group than there is in the membership itself. Uh, so I, I think it's probably best to take a look at it through the, the appropriate lens for that, uh, that process. Okay. So there's a motion by Councillor Turner to refer Clause D to the review review process that's underway. Is, some, is there a second for A through F? So let's refer D first, and then we'll go to A through F minus D. Do, is some, <laughs> do I have a second for Councillor Turner's referral? Councillor Hopkins, any other questions? Okay, we'll vote on the referral. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, so we have clauses a through F minus D. Is that if everybody okay with those clauses? And do I have a mover for them? Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. Any comments, questions? I'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, there are no deferred matters or additional business, I don't think. Nope. Um, so I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Kayabaga. I'll call a vote. Or do you want to do it by hand? Let's do it by hand. All in favor? That passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.